That's 2014 NEA jazz master Richard Davis playing the bass on the Van Morrison album Astral Weeks. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced by the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Richard Davis is the bassist everybody wants to play with. He's made some 3,000 recordings, and not just as a jazz musician, but across the genres of classical, pop, and rock. Last week, we heard about his career in jazz and his musical relationships with legends like Ahmad Jamal, Sarah Vaughan, Eric Dolphy, and Elvin Jones. In this, the second of a two-part interview, we turn the spotlight on Davis's playing outside of jazz. For musicians like Van Morrison and Bruce Springsteen, singers like Barbra Streisand and Frank Sinatra, and his continuing love affair with classical music. When Richard Davis was a boy coming up in Chicago, his teacher, Walter Diet, encouraged him to embrace all forms of music and insisted that Richard study classical bass as well as jazz. This advice has served Richard well throughout his long career, and it's advice that he gives to his own students at the University of Wisconsin. Richard's versatility and musical curiosity led him to New York in the 1950s. And that same versatility allowed him to record iconic jazz albums with folks like Eric Dolphy and Elvin Jones, while he was also freelancing with the New York Philharmonic. That's what's so good about New York, playing in different atmospheres, different uh, ensembles, different kinds of music. You're recording on all levels of musics, different music. You're performing at night in a jazz atmosphere, and you do a lot of commercials, you're doing a lot of everything. And that's what made it so much fun, because sometimes you go into a studio with no idea what you're going to have to play. And they call you because they think you're versatile enough to do what they know you can do. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of working with Igor Stravinsky? Can I? You see this shoulder here? I haven't watched that shoulder in 60 years, because that's where he touched me. Who touched you there? Igor Stravinsky. Didn't say nothing. Just walked over to me just after the concert. I did three concerts with him over a weekend, Boston, New York, and D.C. And at the last concert, he had to exit off my side of the stage. And as he walked off the stage, he, he touched me. So I loved him anyway. He was a jazz fanatic. And he wrote music for jazz orchestras. And I just loved it. What was that piece? Rise of Spring. Man, when I heard that piece, that helped me to understand Bartok, Alvin Berg, all those other guys. And I like I like this look. Small man with small glasses. And when he conducted, it was so rhythmic. And it was like his baton was just a part of his body. And I just love being in his company. And the Gunther Schuler got me the gig. And Gunther and I, too, were very close playing concerts together. And you also played with Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, Leonard Bernstein, too. That was another dynamic conductor. When he conducted, man, he felt like you were the only one on the stage with him. He was conducting you. Another great one was Stokowski. He was at type two and George Zell and those guys. But Bernstein I spent a year with playing in the New York Philharmonic and he was rhythmic, very rhythmic, strong sense of rhythm and he would use so much energy. I think they had brought in uh, oxygen tanks while he was on intermission. <laughs> a whole tank of air. <laughs> they had some energy going. Now I know music is music. And good music is good music. And genres are often very silly. But at the same time, there has to be a difference in the making of the music between making classical music with a conductor in an orchestra and making jazz in a smaller ensemble where you're improvising more. You want me to address that? Yes, I would like you to address that. Addressing improvisational music, which is considered jazz, 
and the non-improvisational music, which is considered classical, I would say that the big difference for me was to be able to interpret what was already composed and written. How do you interpret it? Do you make this note short or shorter or longer? Do you phrase this melody because of the harmony is rescinding and resolving? Do you hold on to that note a little longer and let it slide into the slot or what? So you're interpreting as you read. You read more into the music than what's there. In jazz, you're doing all those things that you're composing and improvising and interpreting for the whole time you plan. That's the big difference. And you don't have any music that you're looking at because you've examined all that in your head. That comes from memory. Beethoven was a great improviser, but that died out somewhere along the way. Those guys had figured bass lines and they improvised off of one note. But the thing is, that melody is then repeated, repeated over and over again over the years. So that improvisational thing is diminished because people are repeating those notes for hundreds of years. They're not improvising, they're interpreting. In the meantime, you're also doing work with, with pop musicians. You're, you worked with Frank Sinatra. How did you end up working with Frank Sinatra? Okay, I might modify that and say that the band that was hired was there to support Frank Sinatra's recording. Frank Sinatra didn't say, let's get Richard Davis, you know. Uh, you're involved with a certain clique of musicians called studio recording musicians. There's a contractor, Frank Sinatra's producer or his agent or some, we're going to record and call up this guy to get the musicians. He's what you call a contractor. And because I was very popular in recordings, I would be the one that was called for this particular day, like a lot of other dates. They know you could fit the bill because you could shape the music, you could interpret the music, and you had a good recording sound on your instrument. I can't even remember whether he was even in the studio. We probably put a track down, and he came later to put his voice on that track. That happened lots of times. You also worked with... Van Morrison, or you worked on Van Morrison's album Astro Weeks, which is acclaimed as one of the best albums of all time, and your playing has been cited by Grail Marcus as the greatest bass he has ever heard on a rock album. Well, I'd be darned. I mean, I'd be damned. <laughs> now, the producer of Astro Weeks, Louis Merenstein, says you were pivotal to the creation of that album. Talk about you and Louis Merenstein and Astro Weeks. Me and Lou Merenstein and Astro Weeks. That was a remarkable feeling in the studio. Down the Cypress Avenue With the childlike vision sleeping into view Click and clacking of the high heel shoe. Ford and Fitzroy, Madam Joy. See, I had recorded for Louis Merenstein on a lot of his productions. Mamas and the Papas, already down to uncles and aunts, <laughs> nieces and nephews. <laughs> I had recorded with so many people for Lou. And so he said, Richard, uh, we have a guy coming in from. Ireland or Scotland or somewhere. He said, I want you to get a group together for him. So I chose Jay Berliner on guitar. That guy knows the guitar. I chose Connie Kay on the drums. I called him the security officer because he made you feel secure. He sits there like a Buddha, still, and just playing all those beautiful things with his sticks on this and that. And I chose Warren Smith. On the vibes. And Warren Smith is always smiling. <laughs> you know, he's playing all these nice sounds on the vibe and all that stuff. We went to the studio, the day of recording. Lou passes out the music sheets. See, a music sheet is just a skeletal frame of what is to be played. You have the melody and chords. Nothing filling in on what to do with that. And that's why they depend on you to do it. And so I've started running down a couple of songs 
in my head, you know, just to get familiar with the card changes and all those kind of things. Oh, by the way, some guy come creeping into the studio who we had never seen before, and he goes to the vocal booth. We didn't know who he was. He never spoke to us. We never spoke to him. And Lou said, okay, we're going to uh, make a take. And you got a headset on, so you can at least hear him singing. And so then, on the first take, I just conceived this bass line on those cards. And Lou said, that's tomorrow's rock and roll bass line for bass players. If I ventured in the slipstream I was just playing. But people have come up to me asking me about that album ever since it happened. You also worked on two albums with Bruce Springsteen, including the iconic Born to Run. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a funny story. I'm ready. Well, Bruce wanted me on his album because he had heard Astro Weeks with Van Morrison. Now, this might sideline the effect of Bruce Springsteen and those two CDs you mentioned, but it's in there somewhere. There was a young bass player in New York who thought I was God. I never told him I was. <laughs> but he thought that I was God. He's always hanging around me, wanting me to teach him. And I used to just kind of fluff him off a little bit. This day he came to my house with his girlfriend. And I said, look, man, I got to leave in about another hour and go do this recording session. I said, you want to come with me? Yeah. He got very excited. He and his girlfriend went to the studio. Mind you, I don't know who I'm recording with. I don't know what the music is about. When we get there, I find out later it was a guy named Bruce Springsteen in the control booth with the producer. Sure it didn't matter to me. They said, Richie, we're going to play this track. We want you to put some bass on this track. Okay. So they played it, and then the producer said, Richie, that was, that was good. He says, but you're too close to the guitar line. Think of something different. Okay. They play it again. I put on what I thought was good. And they said, Richard, you are too close to the drums. Can you play something different? This young kid who was sitting in the control booth jumped up and said, Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> he scared everybody. And scared me too. Man, he thought I was God, so nobody's going to tell me what to play. So I put the bass down and went in the control booth. I said, you just be quiet. Just sit here and listen. You know, even on your own CDs, you resist being put in a box. On The Bassist, for example, you mix jazz with spirituals like Go Down Moses. Oh, yeah. Was that on The Bassist, too? It was, indeed. Well, that's a prelude to a CD I want to do with all spirituals. Why do you want to do a CD of all spirituals? It's going back to the roots, where I come from, Baptist Church, and I just feel good going back home. Swing Low Sweet Chariot was my father's favorite hymnal, his favorite song. And he used to hum it around the house all the time. And when he would hum it, I envisioned that he was thinking about angels coming down on a chariot to take him home. And right now as I'm saying that to you, I just felt a flush of skin crawling. Because that was my dad, who I just loved. And there he was humming that song. And I used to practice all the time while he was sleeping, because he worked nights. And I'm practicing in a room next to him. He never complained. 1977, you have been named Bass Player of the Year by Downbeat Magazine eight times. You're really at the height of your success. And you get a phone call that changes 
your career completely. What happened? <laughs> I made a mistake by answering the phone. <laughs> what happened when I got that phone call in 1977 from the University of Wisconsin? First of all, I was surprised. And secondly, I didn't know where Madison, Wisconsin was. And I asked them, where is that? And they said, it's near Milwaukee. I said, I know Milwaukee, you know. And they said, we want to come out here and teach space. And I said, what else do you want me to do? Well, we want to teach a jazz history course. And I said, don't you have somebody doing that? And he said, yeah. I said, won't you stay with them? I know those guys. They do good jobs. And then he said, can we call you back in about six months to a year and offer the same thing? I said, yeah. So then I was thinking that uh, I've always wanted to teach young people, and I never had an opportunity to teach on that scale. And I said, possibly it's time for me to make a change. 23 years in Chicago, 23 years in New York. Now it's time for me to start something else. Meanwhile, I'm asking friends of mine, you know anything about college teaching? And this one woman whose horses I had been training said, ask for tenure. I said, tenure? What is that? <laughs> I'm completely naive. She said, that means they can't fire. Her husband, who never even spoke to me, he didn't speak to anybody. He said, ask him for tenure. Okay. And sure enough, they called me. And they said, we want you to come out, and we're close to the time where we need an answer. I was prepared. And I said, then tell me about this professor stuff you offering me. You offer me what is called assistant professor? Am I helping somebody? Am I assisting somebody? Completely unaware. He said, it's a position. I said, well, I don't like the first three letters. <laughs> I have to laugh at that now because what other kind of professors you got? He said, we have an associate. I don't like the first three letters in that. <laughs> but it sounds like I'm associated with you. I'm still associated with New York. I said, I kind of like that. Now tell me, about, what's, what other professor you have? Full professor. Full professor? Hmm. I envision a guy sitting back, wrestling on his laurels. He's done it all. And I said, I don't like the image of that either. <laughs> he probably thought I was crazy. I said, I'll take associate. And then he said, okay. And then I said, tell me something about tenure. He said, well. He said, well, we don't give that out until so and so and so and so. And I said, well, I'd like to have some. And he said, he'd have to get back to the committee and see what they say. And then he got back to me and said, the committee wants you to present 10 letters of your peers. Well, mind you, he goes to Minsky, Leonard Bernstein, Stokowski, Janice Ian, and everybody I'd work with. I had those 10 letters in the overnight. Sent the letters. He said, they're going to give you tenure. Still didn't know what I'd gotten. <laughs> yeah. Describe how you approach teaching. I approach teaching as a learning experience. I look forward to students teaching me. I think it's an equal sharing. I always say, equated by saying, a mother doesn't know how to be a mother of a child until the child begins to ask for something, crying, a look on the face, or whatever. And she has to figure out through her own experiences, is it milk? Is it a change of diaper? Is it to be cuddled? That to me is a great analogy of what I do. I can treat students in a way, depending on what they are, how they are, they might think I hate them. I'm giving them a rough, tough love treatment. And on the other hand, another student, because of the personality, I continually hug them. But I'm always encouraging them to the potential to do the best. And don't worry about anything. Be the worry to me. <laughs> you just <laughs> do your best. What's the 5 a.m. social club? <laughs> Whew. I've disbanded the idea of the 5 a.m. social club lately, but if I don't get the right answer from a student when I ask them something, I say I'm expecting a call from you 5 o'clock in the morning. 
I'm not expecting a call from you 505. It's got to be 5 o'clock. And the reason I set that time up is because I was single parenting. And at 7 o'clock, I want to give my daughter undivided attention to prepare for school. So you call me at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm free. Nobody has ever not called me at 5 o'clock in the morning. They give me the answer, I say, go back to sleep. That's it. What do you try to impart to students in your classes, especially when you're teaching about jazz? What I'm trying to impart on them is to appreciate the jazz artists as they were and as something that they can become. I always tell them that Johnny Parker wasn't born with the horn in his mouth. He was kicked off the stage a few times because playing bad. He got up and got back on the horse who had thrown him. It's hard work, and the more hard work you do, the more you're going to not only love your instrument, you're going to love yourself. And the thing I want you to do with that knowledge is to impart it to someone else. If you have that knowledge and keep it to yourself, you might as well not have it. Give it to someone else. Bring them along. And when you do that, you're learning more about yourself. I preach that day in and day out. I also think when you're teaching the history of the music, it's important for you to put the music itself in a social, political, historical context. It just didn't spring out of the air, but it came out of a particular time and a particular place. You've been talking to somebody, because that's exactly what I do. I uh, teach the music a time and place besides the music itself, does the music comes from something happening in society? Synoptics, I call it. And then uh, I'll tell the student, well, you know, in this period of time, this was happening. I try to get them to approach the music globally, then cone it down to what we're doing in the class, and they can see where it comes from. I say, this music is about a black person in white society. It's another culture. And I try to get them to know to know the culture that creates the music. Well, another thing that you're doing on campus and in the city itself of Madison is raising consciousness and creating conversations about race and racism. You do various activities in this. Can you talk about some of them and how they came to be and where you see this conversation going forward? Well, I've been having the need to fight against social injustices for a long time. I'm conscious of the fact that lots of people are not aware that they exist because they live in the privileged world. And they don't have to discuss about racism because all the books tell them who they are in school because the curriculum is designed for one side. So when they come into my classes at the university, I make them aware of education items that were not part of the system. They were dismissed. Uh, for example, one student told me, he talked about Martin Luther King and Black History Month. We never talked about that in school because the teacher told us, we don't have to deal with that because we don't have any black students in the class. It tells you how the disease of racism is perpetuated because people who are not a member of the oppressed group are not learning anything about the oppressed group. If they learn something about the oppressed group, they feel the need possibly to make changes. So I said, I'm making you aware now of things that you're not necessarily involved with, but you really are. You just don't realize how important it is to be an ally. And then I'll tell them, I can go back to the 1700s and tell you about allies who are white and try to make things right. So then what I do is teach them about people who have died to make it better for black people. I have many, many white friends who write on these things, who preach on these things. I buy their books. I attend conferences where they're talking. And I try to encourage the other people to come and join me and see what somebody who looks like you is saying something about this. It's a hard conversation for Americans it's to have. It's a hard conversation and especially hard between parents and their children. So I'm dedicated to that.
And that's why in our facilitations, I make sure there's a white female facilitating with me as a co-facilitator, because then they can see how we're intertwined with the same thing. What does it mean for you to be named an NEA Jazz Master? Being named an NEA Jazz Master means that I've been recognized for accomplishments I have made in an indigenous art form. I was joining a elite group of people who had gotten that award before me, and I know all of them. I work with most of them, and I felt like somebody was telling me I belong in that crowd. I think you could be one of the most recorded bass players ever across genres. Can you speculate how that happened, how you ended up in that position? Well, I've recorded at least 3,000 recordings over a period of, uh, I don't know how many years, maybe 24. But word of mouth gets around. Get so-and-so, because he can do so-and-so. Get so-and-so, because he can do so-and-so. And you get all these calls, and you say to yourself, this is what Mama was talking about when she said, do your very best at whatever you're doing, and don't worry about anything else. It'll, it'll come to you. And I said, that's what she was telling me. And she made me do my very best. <laughs> <laughs> she saw to that. Richard Davis, congratulations and thank you. And thank you for being so generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Joe Reed, I appreciate your time spending the time to research all this. So thank you, too, and your crew. That was 2014 NEA Jazz Master Richard Davis in the second of a two-part interview. Richard Davis and the other 2014 Jazz Masters will be honored with a concert and ceremony on January 13th at Jazz at Lincoln Center in New York City. The NEA is webcasting the event live. Go to arts.gov for details. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. Adam Campy is the musical supervisor. Excerpt from The Rite of Spring, composed by Igor Stravinsky and performed by the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Leonard Bernstein, used courtesy of Sony Music Entertainment. Excerpt from Astral Weeks, Sweet Thing and Madame George, composed by Van Morrison from the album Astral Weeks, used courtesy of Warner Music Group. Excerpt from Lift Every Voice, composed by John Rosamond Johnson. Simone, composed by Frank Foster. And Go Down Moses, all performed by Richard Davis from the album The Bassist, used courtesy of Palmetto Records. The Artworks podcast is posted every Thursday at arts.gov. You can subscribe to Artworks at iTunes U. Just click on the iTunes link in our podcast page. Next week, 2014 NEA Jazz Master Anthony Braxton. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. <laughs>